Wait, how does this work? You just press the button. This one? No, not that one. <laughs> You're listening to Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. Everything seems impossible to what happens. Everyone would be affected by a nuclear war. Our government is planning to spend trillions of dollars to develop new nuclear weapons that we don't need. You can't win a nuclear war. We are all experts on nuclear weapons because we are all going to be affected by those nuclear weapons. And here are your hosts, Joe Cirincioni and Michelle Dover. Welcome back to Press the Button. I'm Michelle Dover. And I'm Joe Cirincioni. We're broadcasting to you from the home of the world champion, Washington National. That's right. World <laughs> champion. Feel good. Un- unbelievable. So anytime you think that something is impossible, just remember this year in sports history. I'm really going to need that this year. <laughs> Really, really that. We've got a great show for you uh, this this week. We start off with uh, early warning. Michelle, what are you going to cover? All the latest developments, including North Korea's most recent missile tests, as well as the continuing fallout of the impeachment crisis. And then we're skipping the question you usually ask me. But if you do have a question any of the listeners would like to ask me about nuclear policy or anything else, send it to press the button at plowshares.org. We have to skip it because... Because I maybe had a little too much fun with the interview segment <laughs> in which I talked with Dr. Zia Mian, co-director of Princeton Science and Global Security Program. We had a great conversation. It is a great conversation. Please stay tuned for this. You're going to love this. He is one of the most interesting people in the field today. We start talking about you know the crisis in India, Pakistan, and move on to whether the current nuclear order is worth saving cover quite a bit of ground. So if you like what you hear, please remember to rate us, uh, share us with your friends, like us, subscribe to the podcast. It matters a lot uh, what you have to say to your friends and your family and the podcast universe about Press the Button. The clock is ticking. Let's get going. And now, early warning, early warning, early warning, early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Welcome back to Early Warning. I'm your host, Michelle Dover, and today I am joined by Esther M, Program Officer at the National Committee on North Korea, and Akshay Vikram, Hail Fellow here at Plowshares Fund. Akshay, Esther, welcome to the show. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Um, first things first, how do you like our new tablecloth? It is fantastic. For all of you wondering what it looks like, go to Twitter. You will see photos. It is great. Um, but that is not why I invited you here. Invited you here to discuss the news in seven minutes. Are you ready? And our seven minutes starts now. Esther, North Korea tested two missiles last week. We've seen quite a few missile tests really this fall. And as we discussed previously on this podcast, North Korea has set an end of year deadline for talks. Are tensions rising? Uh, do you see a successful resolution to this in time for that deadline? I think I'm not optimistic about a significant breakthrough by the end of this year or this end of year deadline that Kim Jong Un has reported out. And you know, I think the missile tests are, you know, a technical um, capability testing for the North Koreans, um, but it's also, I think, confirming uh, the North Korean resolve to come out pretty obstinate against the United States in these talks. Um, a few days prior to the missile test, um, the Nodong Shimun, which is the domestic newspaper in North Korea, um, there was a, an editorial published basically saying that the United that North Korea um, would not come back to talks uh, positively unless the United States removed its hostile policy. And I think that that in conjunction with the tests are just an affirmation of North Korea hunkering down on its position and putting or trying to gain more leverage um, in, in possible talks. I think working level talks might occur, but I'm not sure that there is um, a, a good outlook for an agreement by the end of the year. And what's the view from South Korea? The South Koreans, I think, have diplomatically tried to keep the window open. Obviously, these tests, um, the missiles that are being tested are a threat to South Korean 
um, to South Korea. But I think they have tried to diplomatically confirm that, you know, their missile defense systems and their capability, their ability to intercept such missiles um, are strong. And uh, and so they're trying to keep the window open, despite, I think, some of the real threats that South Korea could face from some of these weapons. So you're a longtime Korea Peninsula watcher. And is there anything about this moment that is reminiscent of what we've seen before? Yeah, I think there's some really interesting parallels to October 2000. Um, I don't know if everybody will recall, but in North Korean, um, the vi- I believe he was the first vice chairman of the National Defense Commission, the highest ranking North Korean official to come to the United States. And he came and delivered a letter to President Clinton inviting him uh, to North Korea to come and visit Pyongyang. And there was this huge debate within the administration of whether Clinton should go. And then, if you recall, in November uh, 2000, uh, the elections happened and we were thrown into a constitutional crisis over the results of that election. And I think there are interesting parallels to that, to the impeachment inquiry now. And I think there's a lot of pressure on this administration about whether Trump should engage in another summit with Kim Jong un. And I think. You know, if there was to be another summit, it would likely be in Pyongyang. Or certainly, I think that's what Kim Jong Un wants, and I think that's what Trump wants too. But you know, obviously, they're very different variables. You know, in 2000, North Korea did not have nuclear weapons; its um, fissile material, material production was frozen. Um, you know, all of those made it a lot easier to come to an agreement, uh, especially in that time, was a, a missile agreement with the North Koreans. Um, and that administration, you know, the Clinton administration was highly focused on process. And I think that's differently missing in this moment, um, is this focus on process and getting good um, working level negotiations to hammer out these technical details. And so, yeah, I think there are parallels, but maybe we're not re- learning the right lessons. So Akshay, in our second story, This week marks the 40th anniversary of the 1979 U.S. Embassy hostage crisis. Iranian officials have just announced that Iran is now operating 60 advanced centrifuges, twice as many as before, in violation of the nuclear agreement. Um, As we've discussed previously on this podcast, that step does not have an immediate proliferation implication. You can stop the centrifuges from spinning just as you turn them on. So who is this move aimed at? So I think you can draw a direct line from the 1979 hostage crisis to today. Uh, So in 1979, during the Iranian Revolution, uh, American diplomats were taken hostage for 444 days. And this was, for many Americans, their first impression of Iran and the new Iranian regime. And I think from that moment, especially in this town in Washington, you see a lot of institutionalization of the resentment towards Iran. And that leads to policies like Trump pulling out of the JCPOA with no backup plan. So I think in a funny parallel, the Iranian regime is facing its own sort of hostage crisis on the horizon in Iraq, where Iranian consulates are under severe protest by Iraqis who resent foreign interference in their elections and in their uh, nascent democracy. And Iran is trying to look for a win right now after the JCPOA seems to be falling away. Europe is not trying to, is not able to provide the economic relief that it promised. Uh, and their own neighbor seems to be resenting their presence. They're trying to look for a win. And I think we're going to see more saber rattling from Tehran as uh, they keep losing on other fronts. It, well, glad to know we aren't the only country that will sometimes look abroad to address domestic problems. Or the other country that will earn the opprobrium of Iraqis for interfering. (laughs) Seriously. So in our final story of negotiations on the rocks, the New York Times reported last week that a Russian foreign ministry official said that it is too late to negotiate a new version of the New START treaty between the U.S. and Russia. The Trump administration has said that it wants to replace this treaty with a version that would include China in re- in future reductions of nuclear weapons. And this foreign ministry official said not only will that not be happening, but it is also unclear whether the treaty would be extended. Do you think this will convince the Trump administration to extend New START? 
Well, one would hope that they would learn from Iran the lesson of not ripping up arms control agreements with no backup plan, but let's see if that actually happens. I think there is an important distinction to be made between extending and renegotiating. We don't need to renegotiate this treaty to include China because China has so few nuclear weapons, a couple hundred, that they're in no danger of coming next to the caps that this treaty imposes, which is a couple thousand. Uh, I do think that there is hope that a new president might look at this a different way, but either way, in February 2021, whoever is president will have a few weeks after Inauguration Day to decide whether to extend the treaty with Moscow or not. And with that, our seven minutes are up. Akshay, Esther, thank you so much for joining. Thanks, thank you. Michelle. Welcome back to the interview segment of our podcast. I'm Michelle, one of the co-hosts of Press the Button, and I'm joined today by Dr. Zia Mian. Welcome. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for having me on this podcast. Of course. So I'm going to start by just telling the listeners a little bit about who you are. You are a physicist and the co-director of Princeton's program in science and global security. Among your many achievements, you have co-authored the book Unmaking the Bomb. You've edited several books. You've made two documentary films on peace and security in South Asia. And you recently received the American Physical Society's 2019 Leo Zlard Award for promoting global peace and nuclear disarmament, particularly in South Asia. So congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to dive right in. You know, your area of expertise at its core is really this relationship between India and Pakistan and the nuclear dimension to it. Um, as you know, you know better than I, um, the relationship is severely deteriorating right now. And at the UN General Assembly, um, Pakistan's prime minister warned that nuclear armed co- when nuclear armed countries fight, it impacts everyone. Before the assembly, you wrote a piece in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists about how India and Pakistan's leaders should pursue the possibility of a binding commitment to never resort to war. What steps could they take now to promote peace and security? Well, that's a great question. The crisis between uh, Pakistan and India, as everyone knows, has a very long history and has uh, many dimensions. The current situation that we're facing and that makes it particularly acute is that people may remember that in February of this year, um, there was a suicide attack on uh, a convoy of Indian paramilitary police in Indian-held Kashmir uh, by a young Kashmiri uh, militant uh, from the region um, in a suicide bombing that managed to kill more than 40 of these Indian uh, paramilitary troops. And that led the right-wing government in India, led by Narendra Modi, to have a a much more belligerent response than many people had expected, given that both India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons. And that response was that for the first time since the India-Pakistan War of 1971, Indian military jet fighters crossed over into Pakistan and carried out an attack on what India said was a camp for militants based in Pakistan who cross over the border from the Pakistani side of Kashmir to the Indian side of Kashmir to launch attacks and have done so often in the past. And so India was uh, trying to send a signal that, you know, we're blaming Pakistan and Pakistan-based militants for this attack. Um, And in this present case, since we know the identity of the attacker, he wasn't actually Pakistani or from Pakistan. He was actually a Kashmiri from Indian-held Kashmir. But the scale of the attack of the suicide attack and then the scale of the Indian response um, created a very severe crisis uh, in the region. And eventually Pakistan, with its very right-wing, militant, angry prime minister, Imran Khan, uh, said, oh no, we're going to retaliate. And so they sent Pakistani jets across the border. And you have to think about this, that we now have two countries with a history of wars going back to 1947 over Kashmir, right? This is, they've had three wars in the past specifically over the future of the people and territory of Kashmir. 
1947, in 1965, and in 1999. And now they were on the verge of war again. And the, when the Pakistani military fighters crossed over into India, the Indians put their airplanes up into the air. An Indian jet fighter was shot down. The pilot was actually captured yeah, after he landed in Pakistani territory. And it looked like we were on the brink of a war. And eventually Pakistan handed the pilot back and you know the situation calmed down. But it was a very, very intense, but very significant shift in the level of violence both countries feel that they can carry out against each other. It's not often we see nuclear armed states, right, actually shooting down each other's airplanes. Why are they... Why are they taking that next step now? What is there something that's shifted in the context that's made them more willing to do this? I think what we're seeing is, in one sense, very similar to what we saw in the first two decades of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, which is they're learning to understand how much force, violence, what kind of threats to make against each other and still feel that their nuclear weapons will actually prevent all-out war from breaking out. And so you, if you think back to the period from 1945 when the U.S. first makes and uses nuclear weapons and destroys Hiroshima and Nagasaki, up to the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s, there were a whole series of crises between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, you know, in Berlin and various other places where there was, you know, great concern about how close the world was going to get to nuclear war culminating in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And at that point, public opinion and sense and the realization that, yeah, nuclear war, when it comes, will be absolutely catastrophic, began the push towards some kind of restraint. And what we've seen is that in the two decades since India and Pakistan both tested nuclear weapons in 1998, they've had a series of crises of various degrees of severity, including mobilizing large numbers of soldiers. But they mobilized soldiers, but they didn't shoot at each other when they did that. And now they've found um, a new level of where they think that they can carry out military operations against each other and still manage to send signals and yet not lead to all-out war. But you never know when the other side will misinterpret your signal. And what's made it especially difficult is that in both India and Pakistan, now we have very right-wing leadership. Narendra Modi leads an ultra-right-wing militant Hindu nationalist political party with a strong majority in parliament now. He, so he feels empowered. And one of his campaign platforms has always been to make India a very strong military power and you know push back very hard on Pakistan. And uh, in Pakistan, we have a military-backed civilian government with Imran Khan, um, also on a platform of strong nationalism. And so the domestic politics in both countries combine with this kind of learning about the threat of use and force and nuclear crises combines to create these moments of intense peril that we're in. And so what we've seen since February is that there was a general election in India uh, when Narendra Modi won re-election and part of his campaign platform was, look, I stood up to Pakistan, I sent the Indian Air Force, so you know this is what we're gonna do. And he sees that as a winning strategy. And so one can expect more hardline responses in future crises, given that Indian policymakers now think that the public supports this kind of hard military solution to these kinds of things. And in Pakistan, Imran Khan has now openly threatened nuclear war multiple times, including in an op-ed in the New York Times and in a speech at the United Nations General Assembly because of uh, a new action by the Indian government, which was to remove the constitutional protections given to Kashmir in the Indian constitution, which guaranteed a certain degree of autonomy and decision making for that region, given the conditions under which it acceded to India uh, at the time of partition in 1947. And so undoing this very long standing autonomous status um, was certainly going to risk a lot of domestic resistance in Kashmir. And so the Indian government basically has clamped down completely on freedom of movement and freedom of speech and communication in Kashmir now for well over a month now. And everybody expects that when this curfew and control and repression begins to end, 
there will be protests. And when there are protests, there will be police violence to control the protests. And then things will go out of control, possibly. So we face an imminent crisis, you know, that everybody expects in the near future. And so when the prime minister of Pakistan says that, you know, we will go to war and when two countries with nuclear weapons go to war, who knows where this will end? It's a very explicit threat of how far Pakistan's willing to go. And so what we tried to do was to make the case that there is an alternative. Switching gears, because, you know, I think you're what you brought up about how nuclear weapon states relate to each other, how they're reevaluating the environment that they're in. You and I have talked a lot about the ban treaty, um, about the challenges and the questions that um, it, but also the broader nuclear order are going to face this coming spring, um, particularly at the NPT review conference. Um, What are the questions we should be asking ourselves um, of the future of the nuclear order? of what this new world is going to look like, you know, in a place where, um, you know, states like India and Pakistan are testing out new ways, more violent ways of of interacting. Well, the nuclear order um, is having a severe crisis. It's actually having many severe crises all at the same time. Uh, At the core, though, is what we would call a legitimacy crisis that for a very long time, the established nuclear weapon states, the US, Russia, Britain, France, China, the first five to get nuclear weapons, um, for the first several decades of when they had nuclear weapons, they insisted that it was okay for them to have nuclear weapons and that because of the Cold War and, and national security and so on. And it took a huge effort to convince their policymakers and for them to convince each other that we actually needed some kind of collective structures of restraint and control to stop runaway arms racing, nuclear crises, and the prospect of nuclear war. And eventually, some kind of system of checks was put in place, in large part because public opinion in key countries, the United States, Britain, France, and others, but even in China and in Russia, policymakers felt that they needed to show some degree of responsibility, given the terrible catastrophic damage from nuclear weapons. And so when their public said, look, we don't trust you anymore, given what you've done in the world, they had to prove that they were trustworthy. And so arms control and restraint was a a way of showing that they were reliable and responsible policymakers. That structure has started to break down because the promises and commitments that were made in the late 1960s under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and in a series of arms control treaties between the US and the Soviet Union um, have all now proven to have a very short lifetime compared to the lifetime of nuclear weapons. So think about it this way. In 1968, the US, Soviet Union, and Britain agreed in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that they would negotiate in good faith an end to the nuclear arms race at an early date and nuclear disarmament. There had been no negotiations on nuclear disarmament since 1968 that these countries have been party to. In the early 1970s, the US and the Soviet Union agreed an anti-ballistic missile treaty because they saw ballistic missile defenses as a a way to drive the other side to make more nuclear weapons and so fueling an arms race. So they agreed, we'll just have a treaty not to make ballistic missile defenses. That way we can keep the number of nuclear arsenals that we have smaller than they otherwise might be because we don't need the extra weapons to overwhelm your missile defense. Even if it doesn't work, we're going to have to assume that it might. That treaty, the US withdrew from under George W. Bush. Then we've had the INF Treaty, which was agreed in the 1980s after a huge public mobilization in the United States and across Europe, leading Reagan and Gorbachev to say, look, enough, we have to stop this. The US and Russia have withdrawn from this treaty now also. So all the promises of restraint, the commitments that were made have all very quickly unraveled. At the same time, new countries have developed nuclear weapons, India, Pakistan, North Korea, 
in particular, and they are still on the learning path to how many nuclear weapons do they need? What kind of nuclear postures and policies will they have? How will they threaten to use nuclear weapons in a crisis? How will they manage to end a crisis without it turning into war? And so they look back at the history of the United States and the Soviet Union and so on, and they think, well, yeah, they did it. They got through crises. We can get through crises. And you actually see many of the same kind of pathologies of crisis behavior in India, Pakistan, and Israel that, and North Korea that you saw with the superpowers during the decades of the Cold War. And it's finally, I think, the fact that the vast majority of countries in the world, there are 190 odd countries in the world, only nine have nuclear weapons. The other 180, whatever it is, have chosen not to have nuclear weapons. And they've decided that they can't accept a future where they live in this constant risk that nine countries may basically end civilization as we know it and kill millions and millions of people. So they've decided to do something about it. And this is part of the core challenge that we face now, that who gets to decide the future of the world is up for grabs now. During the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union said, we will decide. We are superpowers and we'll negotiate between each other. And you guys just have to wait until we have summit diplomacy and resolve things. And you'll be grateful for what you get because you can't make us do anything that we don't want. And the rest of the world has decided we're not going to go back to that model now that we have the US launching a new generation of nuclear weapons, the Russians launching a new generation of weapons, the British and the French talking about launching their next generation of nuclear weapons, the Chinese modernizing their nuclear weapons. We're not going to go back to that where we wait for these countries with nuclear weapons to decide the fate of the world. People have said, look, there are, we have a say to it, it's our world. And we're going to decide. And so 122 countries in 2017 agree a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And this is going to be the big struggle next year at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Conference. And for a long time afterwards, because this is only the beginning of this struggle. It's not the end of the struggle about who decides how human society and human civilization conducts its affairs. Nine countries with nuclear weapons or everybody else. So drawing on this thread, I mean, we're talking, so the ban treaty, we're talking about primarily countries that don't have nuclear weapons, um, making, taking a stand, making a statement, reclaiming that power in a way. What about the public in countries that do have nuclear weapons? I know you have a project ongoing, right, that's just started with, um, supported by the American Physicist Society um, to engage the U.S. physics community. What do you what do you hope to achieve with that? Is that connected into what we were just talking about? Yeah, the physicists have had a long history with nuclear weapons. I mean, you know, we are responsible for nuclear weapons, for the very idea of nuclear weapons. I mean, in March 1940, five years before the building of the first bomb and before its first use, um, physicists actually worked out exactly that a nuclear weapon is possible in theory. And what people don't remember is that they also worked out what a nuclear weapon would do if somebody actually built it. And they described and calculated the effects of the blast, the effects of the fire, and the effects of the radiation. And they predicted the existence of nuclear fallout that would be carried by the wind and spread by in whichever direction the wind blows. And so when the United States chose to make nuclear weapons um, during the Manhattan Project and to use them, and all the countries since then, they all knew what kind of weapon they were making. And it wasn't that, oh, we didn't know. They knew and they chose to do it anyway. And so in 1946, after the Manhattan Project had finished with the bomb and World War II was finished, Albert Einstein and a group of physicists uh, and Einstein was based at Princeton, then created something called the Emergency Committee of the Atomic Scientists. And he wrote a fundraising letter um, to physicists all over the world. And the address was 90 Nassau Street, Princeton, which is just down, <laughs> the, down the street from where my office is now for the Program on Science and Global Security. And it said that nuclear weapons fundamentally changed the future of human civilization, given the scale of destruction. And that physicists have an obligation to help educate the public because the only defense against nuclear weapons 
is, and they said, not wise, enlightened policymakers, but an aroused and insistent and informed citizenry that people, when they are told what nuclear weapons mean for their future and the future of their country, their children, and the land and nature within which their life is possible, that they will choose, in Einstein's words, people will choose life and not death. And so the physicist project from the very beginning was a fundamentally democratic project that to the extent to which people who know about nuclear weapons can help educate everybody else about what nuclear weapons mean in the world, then they have the right to decide for themselves in an informed and educated way. But it's not just informing them. Einstein's letter says an aroused and insistent humanity, right? That they have to become activists. That the whole point of telling people about this is to encourage them to be activists, to get mobilized and to push the policy making process in the direction of nuclear disarmament. And so that was one of the legacies of the physicists. One is to have made nuclear weapons. The other is to believe that you can actually help society become active on the pursuit of nuclear disarmament. And so what we're doing now with support from the American Physical Society is in this two year project to go around to physics departments and physics conferences around the country and eventually to physics physicists in other countries and say, look, this is part of our legacy as a profession and as a community. This is a debt that we owe to humankind because we did this. And so we have to get back in the game and we have to get back in the game in a very specific and particular way, which is to educate ourselves and fellow citizens to engage with policy-making processes to advance nuclear disarmament. Because the big shift that's happened is that unlike the 1940s and the Manhattan Project, there are now thousands of physicists in nuclear weapons laboratories who get paid a salary to make nuclear weapons, to maintain nuclear weapons, to modernize nuclear weapons. And so if the government has nuclear weapon scientists, the public needs scientists on its side to help them understand and make the case of why we can get rid of nuclear weapons and why we should get rid of nuclear weapons. How did you become one of the scientists on, on our side? How did you come to this issue? Because of the work of peace activists. Um, one should never underestimate the value of public campaigning, advocacy, and public conversations, and especially of protest in creating opportunities for people who otherwise wouldn't think about these questions to ask, why are these people doing this? What's going on? What's so important about this thing that people are out there protesting or petitioning or writing or agitating? And so I was a physics student in the late 70s and the early 1980s, and President Reagan was launching his Cold War. Uh, Margaret Thatcher in England was launching uh, a very angry anti-Soviet campaign. There was talk of cruise missiles and neutron bombs and tactical war in Europe and so on. And people said, well, this is about science. What's the physics of all of these things? And I said, they don't teach it in physics. They don't teach you about cruise missiles and nuclear weapons in physics classes. They teach you the underlying science of nuclear fission and fusion and so on, but they don't teach you about nuclear weapons and what they mean and what they do. And so when I saw people protesting, and in my case, it was the campaign for nuclear disarmament um, and others week after week, and it was in the news that people are campaigning. You had to say, well, so what's going on? Why does this matter? And so I tried to understand and educate myself on these kinds of things. And then once you learn, then you have to make choices. And so the choice I made was that absolutely, you know, that this was something that as a human being, I had an obligation to try and do something about. And as a physicist, you know, this was a small area where I could make a contribution uh, by applying my scientific training to help the, the cause uh, as far as I could. And so I've always done the two things together. And I was very fortunate that uh, Princeton, you know, has a program that brings scientists to do um, this kind of work, and more universities should have these kinds of programs. Well, I'll, I, for one, am so very glad that you chose to to take this course with, with your career and make your contributions in this area. So, Michelle, one thing I wanted to say um, was that many, many years ago, 
before India and Pakistan tested their nuclear weapons in 1998. I was actually working as a researcher and activist in Pakistan uh, on nuclear weapons, one of the very few activists and perhaps the only one working full time on trying to do something about nuclear weapons um, as my job in, in Pakistan at that time. And I was actually funded by the Plowshares Fund. Really? And um, the I worked at a small think tank in Islamabad. And the, the idea back then, and this was in the 90s, in the mid 90s, that the Plowshares Fund was willing to take a risk on funding this young researcher in Pakistan to work on nuclear weapons issues. Uh, had a huge, you know, significance. And people would ask me, but you're being funded by the Americans. You know, this is an American, you know, effort to try and, you know, ha undermine Pakistan's nuclear weapons. And I said, the amazing thing about the Plowshares Fund is that they're opposed to everybody's nuclear weapons. They fund people just like me to argue against, do research and advocacy about American nuclear weapons and British nuclear weapons and Russian nuclear weapons. It's about the weapons not the country. All nuclear weapons are created equal. And our goal is to get rid of all of them. And so that puts the Plowshares Fund in a very special place in terms of the legitimacy and strength that it brings to the movement against nuclear weapons everywhere. Zia, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil, Zach Brown, Derek Sender, Alex Spire, and Will Lowry. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Research by Alex Spire. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.